Over the course of the last decade plus, we've gotten used to seeing the name The Walking Dead quite a bit. Whether that be due to the main show, the comics, the spin-offs, the games, there's no denying how big of a franchise this has become. But with a combined 24 seasons of television across all the mainline TV shows, it's easy to lose your footing or get lost climbing the daunting mountain that is The Walking Dead. So what exactly is a field guide? What is this video that you just clicked on? Well, in how However long this video is, because as I'm writing this, I'm not exactly sure how long it's going to be, I'm going to explain everything about the Walking Dead universe. From the characters, the locations, the rules, the stories, everything that you might want to know, and maybe some stuff you don't care to know, but you'll learn anyways. If you're a big fan of the show, then a lot of this stuff might be common knowledge, but if you're not a fan of the show, this is the only video you'll need to watch, and I'll grant you the certificate of Walking Dead fan myself. From when Rick wakes up in the hospital, to when he gets charted off by helicopter, to Daryl being a loose cannon in the group turned fan favorite, to how he gets all the way to France. Whatever questions you have, whatever you want to learn, it'll be here. And while there are a lot of spin-offs, I'm going to be focusing primarily on The Walking Dead itself, but I'll get into the spin-offs when necessary. If you want to skip to learn something specific, the chapters are in the description, so feel free to go where you want, but I'd highly recommend you watch the entire video because if you don't and you do skip around, you might be a bit confused. So grab a snack, relax, and let's go over the ultimate field guide to The Walking Dead universe. Chapter 1. Zombies As with any form of zombie media, The Walking Dead has its own set of rules that ground this universe and hold it together, while also separating itself and giving it something unique that not all other zombie stories do. The first question people usually have is how the virus started, and it's believed to have originated in France given the name the Wildfire Virus. Within a few months from April of 2010 to September 2010, society as we know it collapsed. The wildfire virus caused people to become increasingly aggressive and resort to cannibalism, even return from the dead, though in The Walking Dead, they're not called zombies. Because in the universe of the show, zombies don't exist. As silly as that sounds, hear me out. Everything that we know about zombies and zombie culture comes from George Romero. So if he doesn't exist in this universe, then the concept of zombies changes entirely. Zombies in this world go by a bunch of different names, and that all really depends on the group of people that are talking about them. You have biters, geeks, rotters, chompers, lurkers, roamers, plenty more, but they're most commonly referred to as walkers. This is mostly because our central group of the show refers to them as walkers, and then the people that they encounter on their journey just join in on the lingo, but I'll get to talking about the group more in a few minutes. For the most part, the zombies in the world of The Walking Dead are slow moving. They can't move very fast, they're loud and honestly a little dumb, yet they still manage to sneak up on our characters on numerous occasions. We've seen time and time again that a few walkers aren't really that big of a deal, but the danger of the walkers comes from numbers. Like a lot of different animals, walkers like to travel together. Where are they going? A lot of times they don't really know. They wait to hear a loud noise or some gunshots and go towards the sound. But when there's nothing to draw their attention, the walkers roam around, gaining more to their ranks, which makes them a deadly threat to anybody who crosses path with a horde. Hordes or herds of walkers are especially dangerous, leading to the group making rash decisions that prove who they truly are on the inside. You can choose to try and help someone in what could be your final moments, or you could do whatever it takes to make sure you survive, however selfishly that may be. The basic premise of the show, at least in the beginning, is survival. The living versus the dead. So how do you kill a walker? Chapter 2. Rules. So like most zombie media, The Walking Dead is the same in that you get bit, you're turning into a walker. Well, for the most part, if you're lucky enough to get bit on like an arm or your leg, you can amputate it and possibly live, but that's also not always the case. So you get bit and you turn into a zombie. That's how zombies come to be, right? Well then how come there's seemingly so many different hordes of zombies and they're literally everywhere, even though there weren't initially zombies there to begin with? 
Well, this is where The Walking Dead does something different with its rules about zombies. The wildfire virus doesn't spread from bites. It can, but it's also airborne, meaning that if you die, even without a walker bite, you're turning into a zombie. This is quite the revelation, and it shakes the group up when they learn about this, and some people in the universe are forced to learn this the hard way. So if everybody's a zombie no matter what, how do you kill a walker? The part about zombies that reanimates them in this universe is their brain. So if you take out a walker's brains, then they're down for good. No matter how many times you shoot a walker, that thing is gonna keep coming for you until you land that headshot. Complete bodily dismemberment is also a fairly good option, though even if you do that and don't destroy the zombie head, it will still be, I guess, technically alive. Further on into the apocalypse, when everybody is more well-versed with the rules and the logistics, as soon as somebody dies, even if it's not from a walker bite, they will usually mercy kill them by... <coughs> shutting off their brains before they turn. Like I mentioned before, walkers are pretty dumb creatures. They follow sound and lights because where there's sound and light, there's usually food. But this can be taken advantage of, like in this scene where Daryl uses an alarm clock to lure a horde of walkers away from the group. Of course, this didn't keep the walkers away, but that was for another reason, one I'll get to later. So walkers react to sound and sight, but what about their other senses? Are they still intact? Yes, they certainly are, at least presumably. Taste is still there for obvious reasons. Sight is there unless it's been taken away from them, but smell is the topic of our next discussion. There is a clear difference between the walkers and the humans. To us, of course, but also to the walkers, and this has to do with smell. There are many times in the series, dating as far back as the second episode, where the characters will take the blood and guts of the walkers and apply it to themselves in order to blend in. This plan usually works, or at least it could work if it weren't for outside factors working against them. In this scene, Glenn and Rick are fully protected when they're covered in guts, but it starts raining and the smell starts coming off of them, forcing them to run. In this scene, the group is safely traversing through a horde of walkers, until this kid Sam starts making too much noise and the walkers catch on that he's human, meaning that above all else, walkers prioritize the sounds they hear rather than any of their other senses. So there's all these rules when it comes to walkers, but what about the world they live in now? Is there any remaining military or law and order in place? No, there's not, at least not for a while. At the very beginning of the series, the survivors are out to protect their own group and themselves. People go on to become as big of a threat as the walkers themselves as society continues to crumble, man turns on man, and it's really a giant domino effect to a darker world. Now this does change over the course of the show and into the spin-offs, and like I said, I'll get to that later, but now that we know how to get rid of walkers, what ways are the most effective? Meaning, what weapons should I use? Chapter 3, Weaponry There is quite an extensive history when it comes to weaponry in The Walking Dead. Some of the weapons seem quite useful and effective, and other times they seem nonsensical and idiotic. Everyone has their own ideal set of weapons when the zombie apocalypse comes. A couple knives, an axe or a sword, maybe a few guns, and that's exactly what we see in the first few seasons. The weapons are all practical and seem like something that the average Joe could come across or have in their possession. Even the weapons that don't seem that way, like maybe Shane's shotgun for example, are given passes because Shane was a police officer and he had access to this weapon before the outbreak. Of all the weapons in the first few seasons, the one that seems the least practical is actually Rick's Colt Python. It would be more difficult to reload, louder which would attract more walkers, and overall probably Probably not the best weapon to use, but it's an iconic weapon and it adds to Rick's cool factor, so I'll give it a pass. As the seasons go on, more weaponry is introduced. Weapons that don't exactly seem like something the average Joe could get their hands on, fully automatic rifles, night vision scopes, an RPG, this gun that Daryl has that I can only assume is some sort of alien space rifle, and Negan's absolutely ridiculous modified Mac-10. These two weapons are part of the same scene, by the way. The world had less people fighting for these valuable weapons, so I guess it would make sense that along the journey, everybody would acquire more advanced guns, and in the mid to late seasons, 
these guns were around every corner. Each character had a gun that looked like it was straight off the assembly line of the Call of Duty gunsmith, but again, this was to up the cool factor of the show and add some exciting things to look at. But towards the tail end of the show, minus the final season, it seemed that all the ammo and resources to make ammo had been spent, so they resorted to more close-up and personal weapons. Some members of the group were already ahead of the curve on this one, like Daryl, whose go-to weapon is a high-powered crossbow, and Michonne, who's more deadly with a katana than Beatrix Kiddo. Well, maybe not, but the others had to catch up with their skills in close quarters combat, and this led to a lot of different weapons. Bows were a pretty frequent weapon used among the survivors, as were knives, swords, all kinds of medieval weaponry, and some other, let's just say, puzzling weapons. There's Kelly's slingshot, which I just don't really think would ever kill a walker, but they did become increasingly fragile over the years, so maybe. But then there's weapons like this, and this, and however creative these might be, the word practical seems to have completely slipped the mind. Of course, I can't leave this chapter without mentioning Negan's baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire named Lucille. One of the most formidable and feared weapons in all of The Walking Dead, though if I'm being honest, I don't really think the barbed wire changes all that much of the bat being used as a weapon. Anyways, let's meet the cast. Chapter 4, The Group. Any great story needs its set of heroes to follow, and this series has many. Very many. Our group of survivors doesn't actually have a concrete name, so I'm gonna very plainly call them the survivors. The survivors have undergone many changes over the years. From new people being added to losing people along the journey, the survivors really started here in a camp just outside of Atlanta. This is the season one group. The notable survivors here are Rick Grimes, our central protagonist of the series, Shane Walsh, Rick's best friend and former partner in the police force, Lori and Carl, Rick's wife and son, Glenn Ree, the likable and cheerful guy of the group and former pizza delivery boy, Andrea, the badass woman who's capable of taking care of herself, Dale, the moral compass and father figure, Carol and Sophia, the quiet housewife and her daughter, T-Dog, the token comedic relief character, and Daryl Dixon, the selfish hunter of the group. There's also a very important person in season one, the man who initially saves Rick Grimes, and that's Morgan Jones. Though his only appearance in season one is the pilot episode, Morgan would eventually go on to have a huge role in not only The Walking Dead, but The Walking Dead universe as a whole. As they continue traveling, they stumble upon a farm, adding in Herschel Green and his daughters Maggie and Beth. They also lose Shane Walsh for a number of reasons, and Sophia, presenting Carol with her first child loss in the apocalypse, a trend we would continue to see for some time. In season three, the group goes to the prison, meeting some former inmates who they dispose of rather quickly, and also add one of the show's most recognizable faces with Michonne, losing Lori, Andrea, and T-Dog in the process, but it's a pretty even trade if you ask me. They also add Tyrese, Sasha, and Bob. After the prison, the group is scattered, but this allows Glenn and Tara, another new member of the group, to run into Abraham, Rosita, and Eugene. When the survivors reconvene at Terminus, they deal with some issues there and meet Father Gabriel, a whiny, cowardly, and annoying priest that they take with them on their journey to go and find Beth, but she doesn't make it, and neither does Tyrese an episode later. They do gain Noah, and with the group on the road, this is the time that many refer to as the best group in the show, myself included. Then they arrive at Alexandria, and I wouldn't say that they necessarily gain anyone, they just kind of force their way of living onto all of the Alexandrians because they have to in order to survive. Along our group's journey, unbeknownst to them, they've been followed by a familiar face, one Morgan Jones, who finally reunites with Rick for the first time since we last saw him in Season 3, Episode 12, Clear, where Morgan had officially lost his mind. The survivors go through many more changes, losing notable member after notable member, until they see that the world is much larger than they initially thought. They meet King Ezekiel of the Kingdom, and Jesus from the Hilltop, and all these groups start to blend together to form one giant group of survivors. The most notable change that our group ever faced was the loss of Rick Grimes. 
After being very badly injured and impaled by a piece of rebar, Rick sacrifices himself by blowing up a bridge that had hundreds of walkers trying to cross over it. Had the walkers crossed, they would have spelled certain, maybe not doom, but certain trouble for all of the communities. As far as our group was concerned, Rick died in that explosion, but that wasn't true, and Rick was secretly taken away in a helicopter with the help of Jadis. Rick was charted off, never to be seen again. Maybe. They lose more members and eventually are left with this. I like to think of the survivors in three different phases, and everybody who isn't pictured is more or less a background character during the in-between phases. There's the Season 1 group, the Season 5 group, and the Season 11 group. Some members do more than others, some are remembered more fondly than others, and some are lucky to be part of the group at all. Each season more or less has a group of survivors on its own, even though they might be in different locations or spread out, they're still one group. It's just that the three phases of the groups on screen show how vastly different each phase really was. This ever-growing cast of characters in the group was really brought forth with the change of locations, so that leads me to my next chapter. Chapter 5, Locations. A big part of The Walking Dead has always been the locations. From the many different states they travel to the bigger communities, the what's what and really the where's what has always been a major point of concern among Walking Dead fans because the sense of scale and where everybody has really traveled sometimes comes with an asterisk, so let's start at the very beginning of the show in Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is really the first major location in The Walking Dead. There's the iconic shot of Rick Grimes riding a horse into the city, and a lot of the first season takes place in and around the city of Atlanta. This of course includes the Center for Disease Control, but that seemingly incredibly safe location gets blown up to shreds. From here, the group traveled further south in Georgia where they found the Green Family Farm. The group stays here throughout Season 2 until it's overrun and they're forced to move even further south to the prison. The prison is one of, if not the most iconic location in the show. Even the people who stopped watching the show eventually know of the prison, because this was really the first place that the group considered a home. Sure, the farm was great and all, but everybody was really just biding their time before they figured out their next move. The prison was meant to be a sustaining home for the foreseeable future. This would have worked, too, if it weren't for the governor and his community called Woodbury. Woodbury was a shadow of the former world. It had, well, a governor, a whole town of people, and it seemed like a pretty great place. If not for the leadership, Woodbury probably would have gone on to last for at least a lot longer than it did. But when the governor rolled up to the prison in a tank, the place they considered their home evaporated before their eyes, and the group was forced on the road. They all reconvene at another iconic location, Terminus. Terminus isn't exactly the place it was advertised to be. Instead of being a home to everybody who arrived, they became a meal for the people who already lived there. But the group escapes this fiasco and arrives at Father Gabriel's church. Ideals and leaderships are questioned, and this leads the group to split up once again, for a brief time because they reconvene once again at Grady Memorial Hospital. And this ends, for what was an entire five seasons, the location of Georgia. From Georgia, the group walks a very, very long walk up to Virginia, where they find the Alexandria Safe Zone. Alexandria is, once again, a very iconic location to the Walking Dead universe, and would serve as the main base for our characters right up to the end of the series. But this was also a time in the show where the world grew larger, and our group learned of other groups and communities all around Alexandria. I say all around Alexandria, but in actuality, each location is at least a few hours away by car, so walking and riding horses to each location got a bit unrealistic in some instances, but each location is a few hours away from each other. We first meet the Hilltop community, a pretty self-sustaining group with high walls to keep out the walkers, and they seem to be pretty well off if it weren't for the saviors, hailing from their own location, 
the Sanctuary. We also learn of another community run by King Ezekiel and his pet tiger Shiva called the Kingdom. Alexandria, Hilltop, and the Kingdom engage in a war with the Saviors at the Sanctuary, a war that would last for a long time in our world, but not a long time in universe. There's also some other minor players involved in the war, the community at the Oceanside Resort, which is by far the furthest from any other community, and the Scavengers at a Junkyard. Yes, I mean it, a junkyard. But after the war is settled, these locations remain a constant for the next two seasons, with the final notable location being the Commonwealth, which is all the way over in Ohio. Of course, there's a few smaller locations that appear in a few episodes, but these are all the major places that our group comes across throughout the entire series. But with each new location, also comes somebody who wants to take it from them, or really just cause trouble, and that leads us to the villains. Chapter 6, The Villains Are Too Far Gone. I might have said a name here and there throughout the course of the video, but another big component in The Walking Dead was always the villains. Yes, this world might be ravaged by flesh-eating monsters, but in a world without law and order, sometimes people can be the biggest danger around. The first two seasons, we don't really have any villains per se. There's Dr. Jenner, who locks them into CDC when it's about to explode, but he eventually lets them all go. In season two, we have Shane, which is a controversial topic of its own, whether or not he was a bad guy, but I'll mention him here to keep that side of the fan base happy. Shane was Rick's best friend turned lover for Rick's wife, Lori, and over the course of two seasons, Shane's love for Lori eventually turned him to the brink of insanity insanity, if not actual insanity itself, forcing Rick to put an end to his own best friend. Shane gets a lot of love from the fanbase as well, because he was ahead of the curve with his survival instincts and view of the world. It was kill or be killed, and nobody really agreed with him until like three seasons later on that viewpoint. But like I said, Shane is a pretty controversial pick. Some people don't view him as a villain, some people consider him to be the show's best villain. On to season three, and the first actual major villain that everybody can agree is a villain, Philip Blake, aka The Governor. The Governor was at first a very charming and charismatic leader. He seemed like he had the remnants of civilization under control, and he was the person that everybody could look up to and follow. Well, that doesn't last very long, and we see that the Governor has a multitude of ulterior motives. He clearly has some issues upstairs, keeping jars filled with walker heads on display in his room, and his zombified daughter in the closet. He also takes conflict with our main group very personally, doing his best to turn them against each other, humiliate them, and of course, kill them. But by the end of season three, the governor's own issues lead to his own downfall and the downfall of his community. In season four, we think that maybe Philip has learned from his prior experiences, become a changed man, but in reality, his dangerous and vengeful personality have only heightened, leading him to attack the prison, saying that he wants to use it as his new home, but in reality, he just wants wants revenge against Rick and the whole group, disregarding the prison entirely as he shoots buildings with a literal tank, and this, with a combination of a few other deceptions, eventually leads to his death. But this episode is rather famous for an interesting quote, a quote that really resonates for the entire series. While Rick is trying to convince the governor that this battle doesn't have to happen because they can move past this, he says that despite all their history, they can still come back from this, that they aren't too far gone. But the governor's actions prove that he is too far gone, hence the attack and the name of the episode. I've probably recapped the story enough at this point, but I haven't mentioned a group called the Claimers. After everybody is separated by the battle at the prison, Daryl eventually stumbles upon a group who call themselves the Claimers. They live by simple rules. You find something, you want it, you claim it, and it's yours. Don't lie about anything, and you won't have any issues. But the group's true colors come out when one of the members breaks these rules, and the consequences are severe. The leader of the claimers, Joe, looks at Daryl as his sort of protege. 
Joe has a great amount of respect for Daryl, and while it's not stated explicitly, I've always viewed their interactions as a mentor and apprentice, though Daryl doesn't exactly buy into the whole charade. Things come to a head when the claimers run into Rick, Michonne, and Carl on the road. Rick had previously encountered and killed one of the claimers, and Daryl stands up for Rick, saying that he's a good person, but Joe says that's a lie and overcomes his disappointment to tell the other members to teach Daryl a lesson all the way. Joe then instructs his claimers to do uh, very bad things that I cannot mention on this platform, but I assure you they're very bad. This forces a new reaction out of Rick, and a turning point for Rick's character as a whole. But after the claimers, we get the infamous people of Terminus, people I love to refer to as termites. The termites sent out messages over the radio saying that they have a sanctuary for everybody who arrives, everybody who arrives survives the, the whole charade. The group all hears this message at different locations and heads there only to find out that the termites weren't being very truthful. Now at first glance these termites seem to be like the worst kind of people, and they are, but it's who they had to turn into. We do get a good amount of backstory with the termites, learning that Terminus wasn't always the place that they see it is now, and at first it was a real operation. Everybody who showed up was given safe refuge and a roof over their heads, but certain people came and abused that policy, proving that once again, in the apocalypse, humans can be as big of a threat, if not bigger, than the flesh-eating monsters. So the termites had to change their way of life in order to overcome hostile outside forces, and in this attempt, the leaders of Terminus became too far gone. After the termites are dealt with, we move on to Grady Memorial Hospital, where the leftover Atlanta police force has captured Beth. The force is led by an officer named Dawn, and she too has a pretty strict set of rules. These officers have servants who tend to the officer's needs, whether they want to or not. Dawn tells Beth in a similar fashion to the termites that this place did not start out this way, and in a similar fashion to the claimers, Dawn hints at Beth replacing her. All of these previous villains have shown us the brutality of the apocalypse in The Walking Dead, and that a lot of people have become too far gone in this world, and this toll has an effect on our characters. For the rest of Season 5, there isn't really one set villain that causes trouble for all of our characters. There's members of the Anderson family like Pete, an abusive husband, and Ron, a jealous and bratty teenager, and these two cause troubles for Rick and Carl respectively, but there is another villain that's kind of hiding in plain sight, and that's Rick Grimes himself. Going back to what I said earlier about Shane, I talked about how Rick and the group wouldn't share his view of the world for another few seasons, and season 5 is really when Rick becomes a lot like Shane. Each previous encounter with a villain has changed Rick's mindset on a number of things. The claimers brought out his more brutal side and made him realize that he would do anything to protect the ones he loves, the termites made him lose trust in outsiders, and the police officers made Rick realize that he's far different than who he was before the apocalypse. All of these encounters and changes to Rick's personality comes to a head when he arrives at Alexandria. Even though this community has survived and sustained for a long time, Rick doesn't trust what he sees. He's given opportunities to become part of the community, but there's always a backup plan in case things go sideways. He sees the people around him as weak and feels that a change is needed in order for everybody to survive. He takes matters into his own hands and forces the people around him to change. A lot of this probably sounds very familiar, because a lot of this sounds like Shane's actions from the second season. Shane doesn't view the people around him as strong enough to survive in this world. He always has a backup plan, talking about leaving the farm and going out on his own, or knowing where the weapons are at all times in case things go sideways. Rick tries to implement Shane into their small community time and time again, but Shane doesn't want to comply, and when he feels that things have gone too far, Shane takes matters into his own hands and tries to force the people around him to change. Of course, Shane is motivated by something in the second season that Rick doesn't have in the fifth season, Lori. Shane's love for Lori manifests in ways that alter his perspective of things, and Rick never stoops to that level. But wait a minute. 
Rick actually does stoop near this level, because in Season 5, Rick is all about Pete's wife, Jessie. Rick's interest in Jessie forces him to acclimate to Alexandria and stay around, trying to make things work just like Shane did back at the farm for Lori. Rick gives Jessie special treatment over all the other members in Alexandria, doing tasks for her and wanting to protect her, just like Shane did back at the farm for Lori. Rick takes a drastic action to try and protect Jessie from Pete, just like Shane did back at the farm for Lori, albeit they were different circumstances. None of this is actually pointed out in the show, and yes, Shane's intentions were far less honorable than Rick's ever were, and Rick was never a true villain, but you cannot deny the parallels and symmetry that are there. So if you look at it like this, which I certainly do, because this whole storyline parallel is perhaps my favorite thing in all of The Walking Dead, one can surmise that Shane was really ahead of the curve in certain aspects, because Rick eventually became a pretty similar man. At the same time all of this is happening in Alexandria, unbeknownst to its inhabitants, trouble is brewing close by. For one, there's a horde of walkers that's about to break free from a nearby quarry, and there's also a group of savages called the Wolves. The group has to take on the most notorious group of villains the show has, walkers, while the wolves attack Alexandria, leaving Carol and Morgan to deal with them all almost single-handedly. The leftover wolves that do escape are gunned down by Rick Grimes. This is when the larger world is introduced to the survivors, and eventually brings us to our next group of villains, the Saviors. The Saviors are perhaps the most well-known group of villains, for better or worse. When the Saviors are first introduced, they seem like a small group of bandits stealing stuff from other communities, so Rick hatches a plan like he's a twisted Robin Hood to stop the bad guys from stealing so that way the poor can have more. This doesn't exactly go to plan, and the Saviors are a much bigger threat than anticipated, all being led by their barbed wire baseball bat wielding leader, Negan. Negan is not only charismatic and funny, but he can be downright terrifying under the right circumstances. At this point in the show, the Saviors were by far the most powerful community the group has ever faced. They had the most people in the organization, had the most resources, weapons, food, the list goes on, and this was really shown to us in perhaps the most infamous episode, The Day Will Come When You Won't Be, which is a callback to something Dr. Jenner told Rick while escaping the CDC. In this episode, Negan kills two beloved and fan-favorite characters, forcing Rick to break down crying in front of him and a large portion of the audience to quit watching the show. Negan, as a leader, is honestly quite effective. He has a devoted following of generals who truly believe in his approach, and then all of the underlings follow him mostly out of fear. One thing that a lot of people forget about is Negan's wives. He takes as many wives as he sees fit, even if their heart isn't in it and they're in love with other people. This is an aspect of the show that a lot of people have forgotten, most likely an intentional act by the writers of the show, but I'll get to why that is in a moment. The Saviors have rules and a code to follow, and anybody who breaks it faces harsh consequences. Take Dwight, for example. His punishment for trying to leave with Sherry was getting his face burned with an iron, and Sherry forced to marry Negan. But while Negan seemed despicably evil and most of the Saviors seemed like terrible people, there were a good number of people who joined the Saviors as a way out. We meet characters like Alden, who doesn't like Negan's leadership and doesn't agree with most of the people's morals and values, and eventually joins the Hilltop community. There's also Morales, a member of the Atlanta camp from all the way back in Season 1, who lost his family and saw the Saviors as the best option. Another example of somebody being too far gone. Once Rick takes a full season to gain the confidence to fight back, a war ensues. The combined forces of Alexandria, Hilltop, Kingdom, and Oceanside battle the Saviors and ultimately take down Negan, though their losses on the journey might have overshadowed the victory. In Season 9, we unfortunately wave goodbye to Rick Grimes just in time for the next group of big bad guys to come in, the Whisperers. If Too Far Gone was a picture, it's this. The Whisperers have completely let go of the world that they knew before, favoring a new one where the dead rule the earth, and they rule the dead. 
Using manipulative tactics and maneuvers, the Whisperers gained access to the largest army on the planet, being able to sneak up on our group easily and command the army of the dead to take out any enemies in their path. Their leader Alpha proves to be a deadly opponent, and in the process of trying to get her daughter back that the group has welcomed into their home, Alpha takes drastic measures to take revenge. But our group doesn't back down easy, thinking that there's no way they'll lose to some masked lunatics, but oh boy, they were wrong. Not seeing any other way out of their situation, Carol turns to Negan in order to gain an advantage. Negan has been behind bars for the past six years, but Carol sends him in as a double agent to take down Alpha. Negan comes up successful, though he doesn't quite gain the trust of everybody around him, especially Maggie, whose husband was brutally murdered by Negan himself. While the Alpha has been dealt with, there is still the Beta, who was actually more menacing than Alpha was, Though the combined strength of Daryl, Negan, and Maggie's new friends, the group takes him down as well. Though it takes some time, Negan is eventually not so warmly welcomed into the group. He's around for the highest of highs and even the lowest of lows, and realizes the mistakes he's made in the past, proving to many viewers that Negan in fact, is not too far gone. Negan eventually leaves to do his own thing, and the group is introduced to the Commonwealth. A complete 180 from the Whisperers, and the closest thing we've seen to what the world was like before. People have jobs, not just killing walkers and farming, but like actual jobs that we see in our lives every day. The leader of the Commonwealth is Governor Pamela Milton. And we saw what happened the last time somebody called themselves governor, didn't exactly end up so well, and Pamela Milton just completely breaks that trend, at least at first. When our group first arrives at the Commonwealth, Pamela actually isn't a villain. Sure, the way she runs things makes it so that the rich and powerful stay that way and the peasants stay peasants, but she isn't doing this in any malicious manner. There are some people that hold on to this power and use it for themselves, such as her son Sebastian Milton and the second in command, Lance Hornsby. Let's start with Sebastian, a bratty and annoying teenager that spells trouble for anybody who tries to cross him because of his connections. Eventually, some of Sebastian's shady ordeals come to light, and the people of the Commonwealth turn on him, and Pamela feels that she is losing control of the place that she worked so hard to build. Lance Hornsby, on the other hand, is a much more interesting character. A charismatic and weirdly friendly dude who's more in control of the darker side of the Commonwealth. He understands that there's a natural hierarchy of this place and does everything in his power to keep it that way. When our group figures out what he's doing and tries to stop him, it's like a domino effect that ends the Commonwealth as it once was, and our group takes over new leadership, and it's a pretty happy ending. So there are tons of bad guys and villains that our group has faced over the years, even some smaller ones that I didn't mention, but each new season really comes with the introduction of a new bad guy or a continuation of the bad guy from the previous season. And that's the end. Kinda, because the universe is far from over, and it's been going on for far longer as well, which brings us to... Chapter 7, The Extended Universe. The Walking Dead is also pretty notable for its extended universe, with many different spin-offs, shorts, video games, and I'm gonna briefly touch on all of those, and also highlight a huge part of this universe that we've seen pop up time and time again that I haven't mentioned thus far in the video. When The Walking Dead first aired in 2010, it was an immediate hit. And AMC knew that they should capitalize on the success, along with several other companies who made games that really put their name on the map, like Telltale Games and their rendition of the story of The Walking Dead. Even all these years later, Telltale's Walking Dead series stands to fans as some of, if not the best, Walking Dead content in a sea of what some would call oversaturation. There's four mainline seasons, aka like different games, and spin-offs like the Michonne series. I'd love to go more in depth here, but I'll be saving that for another video. The most popular character in the TV series was Daryl Dixon, so a first-person shooter was made centering on Daryl's adventures before the first season called The Walking Dead Survival Instinct. There's also been plenty of mobile games, a VR game called Onslaught, and an upcoming game called The Walking Dead Destinies, which allows you to change some major decisions from the show and see how that would pan out. 
Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that The Walking Dead show itself was based on a series of comics. A total of 193 comics and 32 volumes were released to tell the whole story. While the show was at least semi-faithful to the comics during its 11 season run, there were aspects that were changed. Characters dying at different points, added characters, different story arcs, but what was completely original to the TV show universe were and are the spin-offs. The most notable spin-off that The Walking Dead has is Fear the Walking Dead. Releasing in 2015, Fear chronicled what the beginning of the outbreak was like over in California through the eyes of the Clark family, specifically Madison, Frank, and Alicia Clark. During the first three seasons, the family has to band together to survive the start of the apocalypse, all of this taking place years before the events of the main show are going on. But going into the fourth season, a change was made. There was a time jump for the characters in Fear, so that way the events could catch up to where the main show was at, and more specifically, so that Morgan Jones could join the cast of Fear. Currently, Fear the Walking Dead is airing its eighth and final season, and it seems that Morgan's actor, Lenny James, is either done with this universe? It's Andrew Garfield playing Spider-Man again. Yeah. Oh, you almost got me. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Or he's going to search for Rick Grimes. Time will tell which is true, especially with an upcoming spin-off starring Rick, but I've got a bit more to cover before I get there. During the seasons of the main show, during the commercial breaks, we would get small snippets of scenes that would compile together to make a short film, like Flight 462, which saw a group of passengers on a plane dealing with the start of the outbreak. There was also Dead in the Water, which saw a group of people in a submarine. So one was way up in the sky and one was way below water. Kind of interesting there. The second major spinoff we saw was The Walking Dead World Beyond, which followed the next generation growing up and surviving in the apocalypse. This show isn't very good, but it was important for one reason. A reason I'll get to, you guessed it, in a few moments. AMC then took this idea of showing different perspectives during the apocalypse and turned it into a show of its own called Tales of the Walking Dead. Each episode centered on a new group of people and what their lives were like either during the apocalypse or at the start of it. We even got to see some backstory for the leader of the Whisperers, Alpha, which was pretty cool. After the series finale of the show aired, everything was bittersweet. The show that so many people loved was over, but it was still really just the beginning, as a number of spin-offs were confirmed that take place after the events of the final season. The first of these spin-offs was called The Walking Dead Dead City, centering on Maggie and Negan traversing through New York City trying to get Maggie's son back from a man who took him named the Croat. The Croat was once part of Negan's saviors, so Maggie has to reluctantly ask for Negan's help to rescue her son. Remember, this is the man who killed her husband, the father of her missing son, so this isn't something Maggie takes lightly. Until it actually is, because Maggie's plan all along was to trade Negan for her son. This plan is successful, and Negan thinks that he's in for a lifetime of torture and torment, but instead he's offered a job as the face of the operation in New York City. While Dead City was initially thought to be a miniseries, it's been confirmed for a second season, which only proves my theory that all of these spin-offs are really just phase two of the Walking Dead universe. The second show in this second phase is The Walking Dead Daryl Dixon. The show chronicles the story of Daryl arriving in France after escaping a large freighter boat and coming across a child that is said to be the new messiah and the leader of the new world. Daryl has to deliver the child across the country, meeting new characters along the way, and becoming involved with the world in France. France is very different from New York City. There are different pockets of survivors doing the typical stuff it takes to survive in an apocalypse, a group of nuns, and a bad group called the Guerrières, led by their leader, Jeanette. I don't know, all of this is French and I failed French in high school. Genet and the Guerrières are also the ones conducting tests of walkers to turn them into variants. They also may or may not have a bigger connection to a bigger threat in this universe. This show is also already confirmed to have a second season, so it seems all of these miniseries are turning into actual series, which I hope remains true for the next and so far final spinoff, 
The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. Remember when I said Rick was mysteriously taken away by helicopter back in Season 9, never to be seen again? Well, that wasn't necessarily true. We got one more glimpse of Rick during the series finale, where he was attempting to escape his captors, a group of people called the CRM. Chapter 8, The CRM, A and B. The CRM has been the biggest mystery in the Walking Dead universe for a long time. We've gotten to learn a bit about them through shows like Fear the Walking Dead and World Beyond, but a large part of their organization is shrouded in mystery. The CRM, or the Civic Republic Military, is the largest organization we've seen across the entire franchise. With over 200,000 members, the CRM is four times larger than the Commonwealth, and that seemed huge for our characters at the time. They have the most resources out of anybody we've seen, and that's really no competition, as none of the other groups we've seen have had access to a helicopter, unless you count those military members that the governor gunned down back in Season 3. But the most impressive thing about the CRM is their reach. In World Beyond, the series that we see the most of the CRM, they're in Nebraska, and seem to have a very big operation there, seemingly their biggest, but that can't possibly be true if that's not where Rick Grimes is. The most notable scene in this series is when we get to see Jadis, who's now a high-ranking official in the CRM, saying that she got her place here by trading something incredibly valuable. We know that the thing she traded was Rick, but we don't know why he's so valuable. In Fear the Walking Dead, the CRM reaches as far south as Texas, and each of these different series show us the same CRM logo, uniform, weapons, and really just cements how powerful this organization is. In the series finale, when we finally see Rick again, he's trying to escape the CRM, but he's caught by a helicopter. A voice over the radio tells Rick that there's no escape for the living as he raises his hands, and we see a very unique skyline in front of him, a skyline that looks very much like Philadelphia. But before he's caught, Rick throws a bag into a boat with his boots and a cell phone with a drawing of Michonne and either Carl or Judith, we're not really sure. In the hopes that somebody would eventually find this and recognize these belongings as Rick's. He smiles, and he has a right to do so because the person who eventually finds these belongings is Michonne. So Michonne sets off abandoning her children in the midst of a war against the Whisperers, to go and find Rick. We also saw Michonne in the series finale, seemingly on the trail of Rick and donning some cool new armor. And that's hopefully where the new spinoff will come into play. What exactly the plot will be, I'm not sure, but it seems that answers about the CRM are imminent. So we know that the CRM is large, we know that they have resources and a big reach around the country, but what exactly are they trying to do? From what we can gather, it seems that the CRM is working on a cure for the virus. When the CRM picks people up, it's either because they are an A or a B. Jadis tells the CRM that Rick is a B, and in World Beyond, she says that she only said he was a B, so that way he didn't get experimented on. The meaning of A and B has always caused a bit of strain among fans of The Walking Dead. We can assume that A's are people who are brought in for testing for the cure, and B's are people who work for the CRM. But I truly believe that we're missing some sort of key information regarding A's and B's. The letter A has been spotted probably close to a dozen times across the 11 seasons of the show. It was on the train car in Terminus, it was on a random fence post in Alexandria, written on Rick's hand, on Daryl's prisoner outfit, on Gabriel's church, and the characters of Alpha and Beta signify A and B, and it seems all of this has led to the CRM. So if Rick is a B, then we can assume that he's going to be working for the CRM during The Ones Who Live, and there's going to need to be a good explanation for his 10 plus year absence during the main series. While we know the CRM is going to be a main focus of The Ones Who Live, with Dead City and Daryl Dixon getting more seasons, the big question is if all of these spin-offs are going to eventually connect. I mentioned that this is like Phase 2, so let's compare this to the universe of Marvel for a second. Marvel had separate movies for separate stories, and then all teamed up in an Avengers movie. Could the same thing be happening here? There was no mention of Rick or the CRM during the first season of Dead City, but there's certainly some indications that the CRM are operating in France. 
Even if that's just a theory, a second season of Daryl Dixon and Dead City could introduce the CRM and eventually find their way back to Rick for a big Avengers-style team-up series or movie to take down the CRM. If that's the case, and everybody is reunited, then it seems like that would be game over, right? Well, there's still a lingering thread that was seemingly just barely introduced, and something that could be the main focus of either this Phase 2 operation, or even a Phase 3 operation, and that's Variant Walkers. Chapter 9, Variants. Variant Walkers have been even more confusing than the CRM for quite some time. Variants were technically introduced in the final part of Season 11, even dedicating an entire episode to them called Variant, but this almost seemed like it was too little too late. These variants were interesting, being able to climb walls and grab onto weapons, but their introduction almost seemed to be more of a callback than anything else. You see, in the first season of the show, even the very first episode, there were indications that walkers were still a shell of their former selves. Morgan's wife even walked up to their house and tried to turn the doorknob. We saw walkers climbing ladders and even running after Rick and Glenn as they were escaping. So how did walkers go from this to this so soon? The answer at the time was that the walkers were decaying over time, and that made sense, but the real answer was actually just the change in showrunners. Frank Darabont was the showrunner for the first two seasons and was subsequently fired, so the walkers went from a threat to more of an obstacle. But then, in the final part of the final season, they reintroduced variant walkers, surprising our characters by making them a bigger threat, but gave zero explanation as to why this was happening. It's like all of a sudden, the walkers decided to become smart, just so that way they would have some callback moments to the first season. But in Daryl Dixon, the walker variants have returned at least to some degree. We see a new type of walker called a burner that has acid blood and scorches you to the touch, and we also see some fast walkers that are being experimented on by a group in charge of France. There was also a post credit scene in World Beyond that took place in France and showed us a running variant. This plotline still seems to be in its infancy, but a big issue fans have had for years is the lack of threat that the walkers pose. Variants would be an excellent way to introduce some stakes in this universe again when it comes to walkers, and even some haste and urgency to try and find a cure. So perhaps our group will have to work with the CRM to get rid of the variants, and then they go to war. It's all a guessing game from here on, but one thing is for certain, the possibilities are great, and this world has never seemed bigger than it does right now. And that is the Ultimate Walking Dead Field Guide. This video took hours and hours to research, write, record, and edit, so if you enjoyed it, if you learned something new, or if you were just reminded of something you forgot or even entertained, let me know that by liking the video and commenting down below your thoughts. Also, let me know if you enjoyed this format of video and the field guide in general. This was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun. So if you liked this, then I've got some other field guides planned. I really have to know like everything about the subject if I'm going to do a field guide on it, but comment down below if there's something you'd want to see a field guide video on. If you've watched this whole video, I just want to say thank you, subscribe for more, and I'll see you all in the next one. Yeah.